Hey everybody, welcome to Facebook Live with us. We are doing this for the very first time. Uh, Dinesh's book actually comes out July 31st, but you guys are gonna be the first ones to get the book. So be sure and sign up to get to receive the book at biglibook.com slash live and Dinesh will sign the book live for you and he will also take some questions from you. So be sure and uh, you know ask whatever you want. Uh, we'll get to as many questions as possible, but um, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. This is, uh, this is a really cool thing. We've never done this before, so you are actually witnessing something extremely new for us. So um, I wanted to introduce you to my hubby who wrote this book, and I think he pops out books like faster than I can cook uh, pancakes. I don't know. I, I think he does them even faster than that because I don't cook. So um, anyway, um, it's a really great book. He's exposing a lot of lies that are told by the left. Um, and uh, I think you're just going to absolutely love it. Um, also, you will be getting a free first chapter to look at before you get the book. And so that's going to be really exciting. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to my husband, Dinesh D'Souza. Here he is. Hi, everyone. I'm Dinesh D'Souza. And um, you know, I think this is probably book number 16 or 17 for me. Uh, I've been writing them since my first book, Illiberal Education, came out in 1991. In some ways, this is a very new uh, topic that I'm uh, confronted with. Uh, for many years, really almost a generation, the left would play the race card on us. Uh, the conservatives, the uh, Republicans, you're a bunch of racists. Uh, as you know, if you read the book Hillary's America or saw the movie, uh, we challenge that narrative. Uh, that's a, a big lie unto itself. And we show the Democratic Party is really the party of bigotry. They have been uh, for most of their history, and they are now. So now, in the last year and a half or so, the narrative has shifted. And the left now claims that Trump and the Republicans and the conservatives and the libertarians, we are fascists. We are the party of fascism, if not neo-Nazism. And this accusation is not just a incendiary rhetoric. Uh, it's probably the worst thing in the language to call someone a fascist. But it's also aimed at legitimizing the whole strategy, the whole modus operandi of the left, uh, their uh, disruption of the inauguration, uh, their attempt to block conservative speakers from campus, uh, their use of violence, uh, their treatment of Trump as somehow inherently illegitimate. It, it appears like there's a kind of coup effort underway to get Trump out of there, uh, as the left says, by any means necessary. Now, what could possibly in a democratic society justify this? Well, it's, uh, it's what the left says we need to do to get rid of Hitler and with Trump being, in a sense, the new stand-in for Hitler. So this book uh, couldn't be more timely. It takes on this whole narrative. It raises a profound question. We've all heard that fascism and Nazism are on the right. This is the allegation, that they're right-wing ideologies that are rooted in nativism, in racism, in nationalism. Uh, Trump wants to make America great again. Didn't uh, Hitler want to make Germany great again? Uh, none of this has really received a thoughtful response. And so this book is an effort to dig deep into the meaning of fascism. Is it really on the left or on the right? And um, you'll be in for a lot of surprises. So once again, go to biglibook.com. That's the website. Uh, you can order an advanced copy, which you'll receive signed. Uh, and uh, you can ask questions right on this discussion. Uh, we're going to be getting to discussion and to questions very soon. Uh, first, we want to talk to a guest. We have Steve Forbes here. We'll be getting to him in just one minute. And um, also, you can get a free sample chapter of the book, chapter one, uh, the book that sets the stage. You can get that uh, in advance. Uh, once again, biglibook.com is the website. Biglibook.com slash live. Uh, sl biglibook.com slash live. Steve Forbes. Uh, the, um, the editor-in-chief of Forbes magazine, still with Forbes, uh, former presidential candidate. Um, 
not the inventor, but certainly the promulgator of the idea of the flat tax in which we all don't pay the same taxes, but we pay at the same rate. Steve has been a presence, a pundit, a scholar, a public figure uh, now for uh, well over two decades. So Steve, I'm delighted to, to welcome you. Good to be here. Thank you. And uh, maybe I'd start by just asking you, when we look at the left today, many times people think that the, the progressives are, are socialist, Obamacare was a socialist uh, uh, initiative. Now obviously socialism in its clinical sense is the workers owning the means of production or the government owning industry. Clearly that's not what's happening here. So how would you analyze Obamacare on the ideological spectrum? Well, if labels can be so misleading because the definitions always seem to change, but I think Obama and his, uh, and his kind recognized early on that you don't have to take over industries. You don't have to nationalize everything to effectively control them. As a matter of fact, it's better to leave them out there as sort of the front people and you can keep excoriating them, uh, taking money out of them, uh, have them carry out your policies and uh, you can be above it all defending, claiming to defend the people, but turn them into your vassals, uh, your, your robots. And uh, that's what we saw undertaking here. And uh, to your point, I really am annoyed they've taken the word progressive. Progress meant m m moving forward, which the American Revolution did. A whole new con inventing a government instead of having it emerge a country from a mystic past out of the forest or whatever. Uh, we invented a nation. And the thing about progressivism and all of the variations out there is the belief in government by experts. Now you want people who know what they're doing in defense and things like that, but this was the belief that experts could manage things better than the messy democracy. That's why we got independent agencies in this country to remove it uh, sensibly from politics, have these experts these uh, do, do engaged in scientific management uh, running our lives. And uh, Wilson, Woodrow Wilson, in effect, said the Constitution was an obsolete document. You know, fine for the horse and buggy age, but not for the modern era. And uh, we've since found out that uh, government by experts means government by bureaucracy. And uh, not to put too fine a point on it, but human organizations always grow, always try to expand, and always forget their origins. Uh, just one anecdote, see Northcote Parkinson, great name, a uh, British historian back in the 1950s wrote a history on the British Navy. And he noticed something strange after World War I. At the time when we didn't think we were going to have to fight a war again, British Navy, largest in the world, sharply downsized, sailors discharged, capital ships mothballed, uh, dock workers laid off, sharp downturn in the Navy, and at the same time, the bureaucracy running the Navy got bigger. And Parkinson noted that the work of an organization has nothing to do with its size. They'll always expand no matter how little work they do. So you know, government we, by experts is ultimately government by tyranny. You mentioned uh, three kind of ideological strains. There's socialism, which we mentioned earlier. There's fascism. And now you mentioned progressivism. progressivism. These seem to be, these were the three big ideologies of the 20th century, and they have one thing in common, collectivism. Because in all those cases, you're talking about a powerful state, uh, and on, uh, a state that continues to expand its power. In fact, the progressives were very candid. The early ones said very clearly, when we say progress, we mean the progressive growth of the centralized state with us, the best people running it. Uh, now, of course, well, the that's danger thing was that uh, they not only did they think they could uh, improve governance by experts, looking at horses and other animals, they thought they can improve human beings. They could improve human nature, and uh, and so this whole concept of running your life is a collectivist idea. Now, interestingly, the progressives and the fascists were closer to each other than either of them were to, to the socialists or the communists. And, and the reason we see this is because both of them used government to control industry. If you think of FDR, FDR didn't want to dig oil out of the ground. He just wanted the government to supervise the process. Same with Obama and Hillary. You got the idea that under Obamacare, 
the government will you you go you go dig out the oil you put it in a barrel and then we'll come and take over and tell you what to do with it how to share the spoils so to speak well and uh, one of the big things the early new deal was the NRA National Recovery Administration which had the blue eagle and it was the motto we do our part what the NRA involved was codes industries leaders would come together set codes of conduct of wages that you could pay, hours that you could work, and if you violated those codes, this was the this was statism run amok. If you violated those codes, you had the force of law come against you. There are numerous cases. Uh, a, a dry cleaner charges less than the code price for pressing a shirt. Tried, convicted, jailed. It should be said that the head of the NRA, FDR's man Johnson, Hugh Johnson. was a, an open fascist. He was an admirer of Mussolini. He well, carried a lot of them around. Were in, the, in the New Deal because, you know, the Great Depression, this is where a lot of these troubles really ran, ran rampant because just to backtrack, after World War I, this huge expansion of government power, the old American tradition kicked in. We started a downsize. The national debt was reduced. Taxes were sharply reduced government by the end of the decade. Federal government was 3%. This was the largest, most sophisticated economy in the world. By 1929, federal government 3% of GDP, a little more than 3%. So the old American tradition was still alive and well. Then came the depression and the feeling and the belief that this showed free markets were inherently unstable and you have to have government to keep it from going off the rails and protect us when these train wrecks happened. The, um, what's remarkable, I think, now largely erased from history is the way that the New Dealers, FDR included. Now, FDR was not an admirer of Hitler, but he was a fan of Mussolini. He would dispatch members of his brain trust to Italy to study fascism, to, to, to adapt the, those at programs. At the time, when it seemed that uh, free markets were a failure, nobody knew why the Depression happened, sort of like a storm tsunami came, and uh, a lot of people said, what well, seems to be doing in Italy seems to work. What can we learn? Maybe, maybe this is a more modern way to uh, conduct an economy. And there's also the belief at the time that even if the government stepped back, the economy would be dominated by a handful of big companies. And that was the natural progression of a modern economy. Galbraith, John Kenneth Galbraith in the 1960s wrote a book called The Industrial State, saying that big companies uh, were autonomous they could dictate what we would buy through big, ad, big business advertising, uh, dictate the pace of change. Well, Schumpeter, the great Austrian economist, could have told him that was preposterous. And we've seen with technology coming along, all these old arrangements can get blown away if you have a free economy. Steve, one, one last question as we think about all this. The, if it is the case that fascism, socialism, progressivism, ideologies of the left, ideologies of experts running society. How is it that fascism in our lifetime has been portrayed pretty successfully as a phenomenon of the right? How, how did that come about? How do you think, how do you pull off a big lie of that sort? Uh, because they weren't, uh, it wasn't, uh, it, it's vocabulary, it's, it's words. Uh, this was not the proletariat, even though we know the Soviet Union was anything but elites uh, exploiting the people. They use the language. And uh, amazingly how powerful language is. If you say you're here to help the people, a whole multitude of sins will get overlooked. So you're saying all and these words like progressive, it's the left capturing the word. And, and, and even if they do things poorly or hurt people, the intentions were good. They occupied the high moral ground. And what happened in the 30s, we forget, in the early 30s, when Hitler took over, even though he was an admirer of Mussolini, Mussolini prevented Hitler from taking over Austria in 1934. Sent the troops to the Brenner Pass and said, we're going to stop this attempted coup in Austria. Italy was the protector of Austria. It wasn't until after the Abyssinian crisis, when the democracies half-heartedly opposed Mussolini's adventure in Africa, that Mussolini decided when Hitler had a chance again in 1938 to take Austria, Mussolini stood back. And so fascism became not just statism, but closely identified to the uh, sinister nationalism exemplified by Nazism, open, absolute racism. So you had the alliance between Mussolini, Hitler, therefore fascism, Nazism, 
uh, just two variants of the same uh, disease. So, uh, and then in uh, Germany, uh, Hitler and the, the Nazis and the communists were fighting to see which authoritarian regime would take over. And so therefore the thing came along thanks to Krupp uh, financing the Nazis. You had a few business people, but mostly the Nazi support came from lower middle class people fearful of uh, what, what was happening on the left. And, uh, but again, uh, there, the, the left was able to portray Hitler as a, a, a rightist, Mussolini as a rightist because they didn't take over industries the way a good socialist would, even though Mussolini had been a socialist editor before World War I. So it got identified, and they were able to get away with the big lie. And uh, it's statism run amok. With Nazism, it was uh, an ugly nationalism, racism, mixed in with statism. And actually, the Italian people had no truck with, with, with this. If you read the history in World War II, they, they, they were not enthusiastic. Well, at the end, they, 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 asked, they killed Mussolini and displayed his body in, in Milan. Yeah, so uh, they somehow sort of uh, conflated uh, everything is uh, Nazi, it's the right, even though if you study the history, Nazi, what is it? German for National Socialist Nazi. I want to thank Steve Forbes for being part of our program. And uh, Steve, thank you so much thank for you, joining Vinesh. us. Thank we really you. appreciate it. We're talking about uh, fascism. We're talking about uh, my uh, forthcoming new book, The Big Lie. Uh, you can get an autographed copy of it. You can also participate in this discussion by sending us questions. You can get a free sample chapter of the book. Uh, go to bigliebook.com slash live. bigliebook.com slash live. Uh, what we've been diving into is, is a lot of the history that has been shrouded in mist. Uh, not only in mist, but also the fact that the left has come in after World War II and retold the story. Uh, prior to World War II, fascism was well understood to be on the left. All the early founders of fascism were on the left. This, is true, this was true in Italy with Mussolini, it was true in France, in Spain, in England, in Germany. And not only were the fascists on the left, but the critics of fascism knew that too. It's only when the progressives came in after World War II, when fascism was then stained with the odor of the Holocaust, uh, Dachau, Auschwitz, and so on, that the progressives said, hey, this is all very damning. If young people knew that we, the left, created all this, uh, it would be terrible for us. The Democratic Party, in fact, would be basically finished in America. So let's, let's try to retell the story. Uh, let's cover up the things that did happen, um, and let's try to, to move fascism from the left, where it belongs, to the right. Uh, this is actually the biggest of big lies. The, the big lie is a term by Hitler, um, and uh, we are seeing a big, big lie told about American politics right now. Yes, and in case you are just joining us, um, Dinesh will be signing some books. If you purchase a book, he will sign it, and you also have a chance to submit a question, and we're gonna try to get to it um, t today so that we can read it um, on air. Um, but let's, but can we get to one or two? Let's get to, this first question uh, comes from Donald from Reno. And basically, he wants to know, how do we help Americans up to the fact that all the labels thrown, thrown by Republicans, by, uh, thrown to Republicans by progressives, Nazi, fascist, biggest, racist, and the list goes on and on, are actually the things that they stand for? So Donald, Dinesh is gonna do his best to answer that question for you. Well, I think, as, uh, I think as Steve Forbes said, the, the left is very clever at appropriating language. Um, and they're able to turn language to their advantage. And uh, with fascism, they've created the idea. First of all, they, they, have, they have submerged the simple question of what is it that the fascists actually believed? What did fascism actually stand for in the mind of the fascists? Um, we need to make some distinctions here. Fascism is not the same as National Socialism. Uh, Mussolini was a fascist, uh, but he, he rejected Hitler's National Socialism. Hitler was a National Socialist, and he rarely, if ever, called himself a fascist. Nevertheless, uh, Fascism and National Socialism were, were cousins. Both were variants of Socialism itself. 
um, uh, what the left has done very cleverly is take the socialism out of national socialism. Because if you kept it in, Hitler, by the way, when Hitler came in, he changed the name of the German Workers' Party to the German National Socialist Workers' Party. He wanted to italicize the socialism that the Nazis stood for. Uh, the Nazis, by the way, had a 25-point program. They laid out the 25 things that they stood for. If you read that 25 program, you literally think you, like you're reading the platform of the Democratic Party circa 2016. Um, so there is a chilling similarity between actual fascism and the politics of the left. And that's something that the left has hidden very carefully. That was great, honey. Um, okay, so this next question is, uh, comes from Helen from San Diego. Um, I encounter many people that don't follow politics, yet believe that they are Democrat because they were taught that Democrats are the good guys. Yeah, Hispanics fall for that one all the time. Is there a succinct point you have to, ha you have to help disrupt that narrative? So, um, Helen? Well, here's my succinct point. Um, the Democratic Party is actually the party of the first global the first genocide in the world was not done by the Nazis. It was actually done by Andrew Jackson and the Jacksonian Democrats against the American Indians. The first uh, slave labor camps were not the Nazi concentration camps. They were actually slave plantations run exclusively. I emphasize the word exclusively by Democrats. Uh, in 1860, I've made this point before in the movie Hillary's America, uh, no Republican owned a slave. All the slaves in the country, we're talking about four million slaves on the eve of the Civil War, were owned by Democrats. So the slave plantation was essentially a democratic phenomenon. Um, the Democratic Party is the party not only of bigotry, of slavery, of the Ku Klux Klan, of lynching. If you think of the, of the Klan, these were the original brown shirts. If you look at the Nazi brown shirts with their ridiculous uniforms, well, the Ku Klux Klan had its ridiculous uniforms. And what did the brown shirts do? They went up to Jews on the street. They would cut off their beard, force them to disrobe. What did the Ku Klux Klan do? They did nighttime raids on black people. They would intimidate them on the street. So people at the time who, were, who traveled from Germany to America noticed that the Klan and the, and the Nazi brown shirts and the Italian uh, fascist black shirts were essentially cut from the same cloth, if I can use that expression. So the real mystery is not of the Democrats the good guys. The Democrats have never been the good guys. These are the people who have done the worst things in American history. The really interesting question is, how did the bad guys learn to pose as the good guys? How did they pull off such a big lie, such a scam, that they were able to get people to believe it? I mean, think about it. How do you get people to know things that are absolutely false. This is the great accomplishment of progressive historiography. It requires historical counter evidence and research to, to destroy this, to debunk it. Uh, that's the kind of work I'm doing in this book. There's really, as far as I know now, no one doing that kind of work on the right. Uh, Hayek did it in his book, The Road to Serfdom. He talked about the affinities between socialism and, and, and fascism. Uh, but today, this kind of research, which will equip you to really uh, knock out the kind of arguments that the left throws at you, that's why you need to get this book. Um, BigLieBook.com slash live is where you go to order your autograph copy. Yes, and uh, the, these are signed, are, by the way, so we oh, can move these over. That is and wonderful. If you, if you so, me a so we're going to take them going. We're going to take some more questions, and I have one right here that I will um, read. Um, basically, it says, um, what has been your, and this is, this is from Stephen from Asheville, uh, what has been your inspiration for educating, lecturing, and writing? You know, ideas are very powerful. Uh, when we think about the, the best things that have happened uh, in this country, well, think of the American founding itself. Uh, America is a very um, unusual country in that it was founded by a group of people who sat around a table and essentially decided what kind of country do we want to be. 
Uh, they, so America was founded by ideas. And even today, to become an American isn't a function of birth or blood. It's a function of assimilating to the American way of life, embracing these American ideas. Well, the bad ideas are also ideas. And today, they are promulgated through the universities, through the media. So I see myself as a kind of detoxifier of all this ideological and intellectual pollution uh, that is put out there by the left. And, um, and I see my work as, as exposing it, debunking it, but doing so in an intellectual way with evidence. Think about it. People are entitled to their own opinions, uh, but they're not entitled to their own facts. And so you can, you can engage in a kind of uh, bloviating or punditry all you want, but if you can come up with devastating facts that you can put on the table that can't be answered, all that the left can do is mutter and blubber and scream and call you names. If you go on my social media, you see, you're a felon. Uh, that is the protest of someone who has no facts at their disposal. Uh, that's why I do it. I, I think that facts at the end of the day are going to change the debate. So in case you're just joining us, um, we want you to, to go over to biglibook.com slash live. Uh, purchase a book. This is this is really cool because, as you can see, he is signing them live for you, and uh, you will be getting the, this copy before it even goes on sale. So this is a, a really really cool thing that Dinesh is doing. Um, so you will, along with the book. But people would write us and they say, "How do I get an autograph copy?" Yeah, there you go. And in the past, we didn't have a mechanism to do to that do this. unless you came to Barnes and Noble at a book signing or something. Right. So this is a way online. Uh, that's what we mean by a live book signing. I'm signing the books now. The book's not even out. No bookstore has it. It will be out July 31st, and so books will be available then, but I will have pre-signed your copy. You can get the autographed copy. You can also get now a sample chapter of the book, so you can get a trailer, if you will, or an appetizer for where this book is going and how this book is going to equip you in the, in the debate right now. Yes, and if you have a, a question for Dinesh that you've never seen him answer, uh, you know, submit that. Hopefully, we will get to it. Uh, right now, though, I am going to uh, answer. Honey, send me some more books. Oh, yes, yes. I'm going to, um, I can't do two things at the same time, as you what? know. What? I can't do that. <laughs> you can, though. He can totally do that, but I can't do that. So, um, question from Josephine from North Belmore. Where is North Belmore? What state is that? Do you know? North Belmore. This, I'm just curious, because North Belmore, so. It's probably in the great state of Belmore. Oh, <laughs> Okay, there we go. Uh, was it Obama? Wait. Was it Al Gore? <laughs> Aren't there 57 states? That was Obama. Uh, he, Belmore may be one of those. He told me that. Okay, well, there we go. So why are the Republicans and conservatives? So it's interesting how they differentiate between Republicans and conservatives. Hmm, interesting. So silent as they are accused of being fascists and Nazis. Good question. Well, yeah. see, the, this is the point that you know, I would make two points about this. The first is that conservatives and Republicans are so used to being on the defensive, uh, being up against the wall, uh, that we typically go into this kind of pathetic pleading mode. I'm not a racist. See, I, you know, I know this guy. He's black. He, you know, some of my best friends are black. This is the defensive mode of somebody who is destined to lose the argument. Uh, in order to win the argument, we have to turn the tables. And as you saw in Hillary's America, we turned the tables by saying not that we are not the racists. We said, wait a minute, all the bad things that you're accusing us of doing, you actually did. Uh, and moreover, this Democratic Party has never acknowledged it. It's never apologized for it. It's never paid one penny of restitution for it. The same is true with fascism. This is a charge that is loosely thrown against the right. You have all these morons who dress up in black outfits and they carry truncheons and they think that they're fighting fascism. Well, if they were truly fighting fascism, they'd be fighting themselves uh, because they are engaging in fascist tactics. Remember one of the first things that the Nazis did when they came to power, they organized a book burning. Well, if I were to go to uh, dozens of campuses today dominated by the left, what would they try to do? They'd essentially try to keep me from getting on the campus. They'd try to keep me from speaking. And if you think about it, that's even worse than a book burning, because in a book burning, uh, you have to take books that are in the library or in the curriculum and burn them. A much more effective way is to keep 
that keep the ideas that you don't agree with off campus completely. You don't even have to burn the book because you don't assign it in the first place. Yes, that is a that was a really great, great, great answer for her. Um, okay, so now next we have Robert from Huntsville. Um, he says, thank you for all the research and well-written books over the years. History has a tendency uh, to repeat itself. How do we get more Americans to be interested in learning history? I know that you're, you're a history buff and I know that you probably can answer this question better than anybody. Well, history is actually, um, it is the only access that we have to human experience because we can't live in the future. This is part of the idiocy, idiocy of progressivism. They pretend to live at some future, in some future world that hasn't even been created. The past, on the other hand, did in fact occur. And while history doesn't, I think, strictly speaking, repeat itself, there are parallels, there are lessons we can learn from history. So when I look, for example, at what's happening in America today, I've never seen the American population so polarized. Uh, American politics used to be a gentleman's argument. We agreed on the goals, we disagreed on the means. I think what's new today is we see a kind of uh, incivility, the idea that the guy who's on the other side isn't just my uh, political adversary, he's my enemy. Uh, I have the feeling that if, if Obama had his way, if, if Obama could have locked me up for life, he would have been delighted. They would be literally popping the champagne in the White House. And, and yet no Republican would think of locking up Michael Moore, for example. We just don't operate or think that way. So there's a kind of thuggishness now in American politics that to me is reminiscent of uh, fascist Italy uh, or the early uh, atmosphere of fascism in Italy in the 20s or the early atmosphere um, with Nazism in the 30s. Uh, the only question is, who are the fascists? Will the real fascists please stand up? Uh, and I demonstrate in this book definitively, I believe, that not only ideologically is the left the party of fascism, but also tactically. The left is the one that uses Nazi tactics. And those tactics are not confined to thugs on the street. They're also confined to the way the Nazis had a term called Gleichschaltung, by which they meant bring all of society, every school, every club, everybody in the whole country into line, into sync with the marching orders, if you will, of the Fuhrer. And that's what the left is trying to do today. They're trying through the institutions of media, of Hollywood, of academia, they're attempting their own Gleichschaltung right here in America. So if you want to know more about this, um, go to biglibook.com slash live. Um, my goal here with history is to turn history into, you may say, an intellectual weapon. I want to make you a very dangerous American in which you are so equipped with knowledge, with facts, but not just, you may say, uh, deep facts, but facts that you can call upon, you can deploy against your opponent. It's going to make you a very scary individual for the very scary times we live in. Yes, absolutely. Um, so we have another question here from uh, Mark from Fredericksburg. Um, and in fact, honey, we were, we were just discussing this yesterday. Um, why do you think Republican senators are backing out of Obama care repeal bill. What is their end game? What do you think? Well, you mentioned, you mentioned earlier the issue of Republicans and conservatives. Mm -hmm. And it's important to know that these are not the same thing. The Republican Party by itself is sort of like the Lions Club and the Democratic Party is like the Kiwanis Club. By themselves, they are just a filter. They're just a club. They're an organization. They don't mm -hmm. stand for anything. Okay. Now, ideologically, the Democratic Party has become, by and large, the party of the left. Right. So the left uses the Democratic Party as its vehicle to get its ideas across. And similarly, conservatives, libertarians, we use the Republican Party. It's our vehicle to get our ideas out. But we have to remember that merely being a Republican doesn't make you a conservative. Uh, the Republican Party is dominated by people who are essentially establishment guys. Mm -hmm. uh, and by establishment guys, I mean that their, their main goal is re-election. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is they live in fear. They live in fear. 
Um, Democrats don't live in fear. And the reason Democrats don't live in fear is that the culture, and here by, by the culture here I mean academia, Hollywood, and the media, celebrates the left. In fact, not only celebrates the left, you can get away with anything as long as you're on the left. This is, you may call it, the fascist exemption. Um, look at a guy like um, Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton knew that it doesn't matter how much. We're not just talking about philandering. We're talking about sexual predation. We're talking about accusations of rape. Any other politics. If this happened to a Republican, their career would be finished right. on day one. Mm -hmm. But Bill Clinton knows he's got, if you will, the leftist immunity pass. Mm -hmm. And so he can get away with it. Uh, Republicans live in fear of the media. If you want to know, people say, you know, to me, uh, well, Boehner was such a wimp. McConnell's a wimp. The reason that these people are wimps is they're scared of the media. They know the media has the power to intimidate, to humiliate, and to destroy your life so badly that your own side will bury you. So I think for our side, it is a tremendous weakness for conservatives that we don't have that media representation. Um, the left has the power to do this to us, and we don't have the power to do it to them. Mm -hmm. One reason I'm making movies in, in addition to writing books is so that we develop the kind of megaphones that the left has long enjoyed. So do you think that this is the very reason why Obamacare repeal bill isn't going nowhere? They're afraid? They're afraid. They, um, they don't know what to replace it with. Uh, also, Democrats realize they're all on the same team. And so even if you don't get all you want, the, the gays uh, on the left will fight for uh, the feminists, even though they get nothing out of it because they know that their turn will come. In a sense, the Democrats operate in, in you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. The Republicans, on the other hand, always want it their way. Right. And so the people who want to completely repeal Obamacare goes, if you don't repeal it, I'm not voting for it. And the guys who want uh, to have some health care insurance, but they don't want uh, Obamacare, they're like, if you want to go all the way, we're, we're getting off the train. And so the Republicans come to an impasse. And uh, that's why in the name of trying to get the whole loaf, you don't even get half you a don't loaf. Even get, well, you know, I've seen this story before. In fact, I was born in a country that is now completely demolished because of it. And uh, it started very much the same way. The, the right kind of self-destructed. So maybe they should kind of take notice of that. And uh, what you said to me was interesting was that yeah. even Hugo Chavez, right, yep. who's on the left, but nevertheless was using all kinds of fascist tactics. They'd come oh, and, yes. you leave the country, they come and take your house, yes. right? Yes. But nevertheless, his rhetoric was that he was fighting fascism. Yes. That the right was the fascist. The right was fascist. That so was what they're rhetoric. doing is they're, they're, they, they look at people like us who believe in free markets, who believe in limited government, uh, who believe in individual initiative, who are against the collectivized power of the state. We are actually the anti-fascists, but the true fascists on the left try to portray us, the anti-fascists, as fascists. So this is crazy. It's an upside-down world. Yeah. It's all exposed right here in this book, The Big Lie. You should go to bigliebook.com slash live. Uh, you can order an autographed copy. You can, you can download a sample chapter. And of course, you can participate, as you are now, in this discussion of fascism and contemporary politics. Yes, um, thank you for that. I'm going to uh, read another question here from uh, Scott from Las Vegas. Las, I say Las Vegas because I speak Spanish, but it's Las Vegas for those of you that don't, OK? So do you believe that we as a nation will see major changes during President Trump's tenure in office? I think that um, Trump represents a sea change. And, um, and as you know, we, we stayed out. We'd never endorsed anyone in the primary. Uh, in fact, we were married by Ted Cruz's dad, Rafael Cruz. Uh, nevertheless, once Trump became the nominee, I, I jumped, if you will, on the Trump bandwagon. Why? Well, part of it was because I knew what a menace Hillary represented. I knew what kind of gangsterism we were in for. Uh, if, if we succeeded Obama, the small gangster, with Hillary, the even bigger gangster with a family tradition of gangsterism to boot. Um, but I also now have seen Trump, um, and, and I compare Trump sometimes to Reagan, uh, because Reagan was a man of priorities. Reagan would focus on these three things, and he would kind of let everything else go. He, he believed that a president can change the world in two, maybe three ways. Trump, uh, bless his heart, fights on all fronts. 
I mean, this guy is pushing legislation. He's fighting on the foreign policy front. He's trying to build the wall. Fighting he's, the media. He's signing executive <laughs> orders. At the same time, he's swatting Meryl Streep over here. He's whacking Saturday Night Live over there. He's, he's faulting CNN and the New York Times. So Trump understands that politics is a culture war as well as a, an ideological or political war. Um, I think if Trump succeeds, uh, we, will, we will be living in a, not just a much different, but a much better country. Uh, the forces against Trump are terrifying. The left wants to get him out of there in any way that they can. They're literally organizing a kind of unofficial coup, you might say. It's, it's disguised, of course, with legality. But not since uh, 1860, I believe, have the Democrats so refused, absolutely refused to accept the result of a free election, a lawful election. And they, they d seem to be demanding, the media is demanding the right to overturn the result of this election. Uh, and this, I think, is a fascist move because the fascists saw the democratic processes as, as fake. Uh, they saw it as a sham. Although they used the mechanisms of democracy. Hitler, the Nazis were the largest party in Germany when Hitler was invited to become chancellor. Mussolini used a kind of quasi-legal mechanism to come to power. But, but nevertheless, they always hated the democratic process and they were determined to subvert it as much as they could. Yes. Well, you know, my aunt from, from Venezuela, she actually um, was afraid that Trump was going to be like Hugo Chavez. I try to explain to her that that wasn't the case at all. Um, you know, Chavez. No, because the, right. the, the signature move of the fascists right. is to take over the media, mm -hmm. uh, is to bring the movie industry into line. Remember, of course, the propaganda films made under Nazism. Right. Um, uh, Mussolini uh, took over the whole press bureau of the Italian uh, media. Uh, so this idea of using the institutions of society to create ideological conformity, this is a pure fascist move. Now Trump, although Trump is frequently called a fascist, here's my question. What has Trump done to interfere with your private life? Nothing. What has Trump done if a true authoritarian right. would have shut down the media? Right. But the media is flaying Trump day after day on every imaginable <laughs> platform. They certainly feel comfortable in doing that. Right. They wouldn't do that if they thought Trump was a real fascist, because real yeah. fascists don't just hit you on Twitter. Real fascists hit you with truncheons. Right. Absolutely. I'll sign some more if you, yes, pass, sign if some you more. Pass, some, um, pass some my yes, way. Yes, here we go. Um, I'm going to give you a few here. Honey, you're a very fast signer. Is that, well, is that how you say it? Fast signer? I am a fast, fast signer. signer. Oh, yeah. And uh, um, let's do another question yes, while um, we're doing it. Yes. So thank you for all you do, Dinesh. You are a true American patriot. How can individuals best combat the progressive brainwashing of our youth in a biased higher education system? We love that one. Uh, Charles from Raleigh. In the long term, we have to... Um, create our own um, systems for delivering education. Uh, happily with technology, that can be done today. You couldn't do it 30 years ago. 30 years ago, you'd have to, the only way to counter the left in academia would be to start 300 new colleges of your own, which we can't do. That's impossible. Um, I think today also people don't realize the degree to which, if you are in so, on, involved in social media, if you have a Facebook, if you have a Twitter, uh, if, you're on, if you're on Instagram, you are a mini publisher. You can get information out. Uh, and you might say, well, gee, I, I only have 100 friends on Facebook. Yeah, but they've got 100 friends on Facebook. So when I produce books, I spend a lot of time on these. You notice I'm not on TV every day. I try to go into sort of retreat, hibernation, reading. Uh, I try to incubate new ideas, put them out there. So a book like this is a, a function of a lot of thought. Uh, and a lot of care in the presentation of it. Uh, why? It's to equip you. So if you take this information and help me get the word out about the books, about the movies, uh, then we become a real force in the culture. Uh, you think of CNN and, and you know fake news CNN. Well, CNN typically about this time of day uh, has about as many followers as I have fans on Facebook, if that. In other words, we have right here available to us a kind of megaphone if we will use it. So I say to people, use your influence. Most of us use maybe 10% of the influence we actually have. 
I'm calling on you to figure out ways in which you can get information that you get from me and from others, get it out to, to more people. And that, makes, that will make you, if you will, a force for good. That's what you can do for your country. I think you just answered the next question here. Uh, Clark from Lexington uh, asks, what are the most effective ways that an average citizen can influence public policy either at the federal or the local level? Yeah, you, people forget how much influence you can exercise simply by, by speaking up, but by speaking up in the right way. Um, uh, when I, you know, the left is very good at this. They, they have become, in a way, almost masters, if you will, of, um, of using social media uh, against, against us. If I, if I go on Twitter and I put out a tweet, within 10 seconds, a whole bunch of leftists will come on and start abusing me. Uh, they'll, they'll attack you, they'll attack me, I'm a felon, blah, blah, blah. Their point is to demoralize us, drive us from public life if they can. Now, now we don't think of doing that. If Nancy Pelosi goes on and tweets something out, 10 Republicans don't go on uh, to blast her, make fun of her, ridicule her family. I mean, generally conservatives don't even think like that. Uh, I mean, I occasionally do, but, but most people don't. Uh, well, I'm very happy to say that we, have, we are joined by a guest, um, James O'Keefe, I think you know. He's um, kind of a bomb thrower in his own right. Project Veritas. Um, uh, and what Project Veritas has become notorious for doing is getting, if you will, secretly into the world of the media and telling you what these guys say behind closed doors blowing their cover. And so, um, welcome James O'Keefe, thank you for being, um, being on with us today. Let me ask you this, I wanna talk a little bit about the media. Mm -hmm. um, part of what you're dealing with is a relatively homogenous mm -hmm. mainstream media. How do you think it became like that way? Well, that's a great question, thanks for having me. This is a great opportunity to talk to your audience and I appreciate that and I'm excited about your book. Um, I, it, I, from my research, and I've researched this extensively, I've read investigative reporting going back to the 70s, somewhere after Watergate, uh, Woodward and Bernstein, uh, something happened where it, there was a combination of, of greed, of laziness, of incompetence, yes, left-wing ideology, but not, not just that. Uh, people used to do this when I was, you know, in the 1970s. They used to win Pulitzer Prizes for going undercover using hidden cameras. But there have been, there's a reliance on anonymous sources now. There's a reliance upon laziness. Journalists don't leave their desks. They read off teleprompters. Some of them go from the limousine to the skyscraper back to the limousine. And there's a growing, there's a growing gap between the American population and what's being said in the inner cities. So we're bringing back the sort of muckraking journalism, exposing the world for what it is. And the mainstream media is propping up this false reality on stilts and it's just sort of this fake reality that Russia is a great example of this. They just keep pushing this and they're so invested in it that they must, you, you tweeted something, I think you said, it's a fight to the finish between Donald Trump and the mainstream media. Only one can emerge victorious at this point. The mainstream media is so invested in their narrative of no voter fraud is not possible and Russia is a thing, that that, that has to be the case even if it isn't. Now, but, uh, part of what I'm trying to get at is this. Now, you know, Debbie's from Venezuela. When Hugo Chavez came in, the media was in Venezuela was against him. Mm -hmm. So Chavez had to send his thugs to newspaper offices to browbeat the media into submission. Uh, the same with Hitler. Hitler actually had to use force against the media to bring it to its knees mm -hmm. so that he could take it over. Uh, Mussolini, the same thing. Now, here's my question. Mm -hmm. Uh, Obama and Hillary don't have to do that. They don't have to go to the New York Times and threaten them and say, listen, you publish our press releases as news on your front page. The New York Times is in line to do that anyway. They don't have to be paid. They don't have to be browbeaten. So my question is, is this simply the fact that they share the same ideology? They recognize they're on the same team? So we, in a sense, have unpaid propagandists for the Democratic Party posing as media? What's going on? Uh, it, there's a lot to unpack here. I'm actually writing a whole book about this. Will be my next book. Um, is why I'd why? say left-wing politics is is a is a portion of it. Is not the entirety of it. The, I saw this with the New York Times spiking the story in Acorn because it would hurt um, uh, it would hurt Obama. They spiked that story in 2008. Uh, instead, did a story about John McCain, and we did this story about Acorn. And what was amazing about that. That this was my beginnings uh, of the Acorn story was the New York Times refused to talk about it 
and the, the Congress of the United States voted to defund ACORN before the New York Times mentioned a word about it. It was an extraordinary series of events. In fact, the New York Times apologized to their readership. So I, I actually think it can be sometimes a good thing for, for truth and justice when the media behaves the way it does because they kind of, they're punching themselves, they're shooting themselves in the foot. Um, they've just become a propaganda mechanism. Um, if you look back to Edward Bernays in the 1920s, he wrote about propaganda. And, and it is, the way I put it, is veritas, which is the Latin word for truth, it's cinema verite, exposing the world. Like, I can't, I, I don't deal in uh, characterizations. I don't deal in punditry. I don't, I don't read off teleprompters. My hidden cameras, or our hidden cameras, expose people in their own words. You're saying the video doesn't lie. The video can't lie. I mean, I can't construct a false reality because I can only report on reality. Their whole thing is to create a false reality. And in fact, isn't it true that if they had the video, let's say, for example, the New York Times were the only people who had the video of Hillary falling face first into the limousine, I bet you they wouldn't have printed it. They wouldn't have printed it. And it, well, they, well, some people say the New York Times doesn't like the Clintons for other reasons from sending to Whitewater, but they probably wouldn't. Um, Obama. Obama. They covered for Obama. They, 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 they have a the perverted relationship with their sources. They've become so, like these White House correspondence dinners. I, I would never want to go to that. I don't, I don't, I don't want to live in D.C. I don't want to become too close with the sources I'm reporting on. And, and when your sources are all in government, how can you, how can you break a big bombshell story on the government? You're going you're gonna to ruin the relationship with your sources. Now, I have the advantage of doing undercover work, so te theoretically I'm not, I don't really have these, these sources. But the real perversion right now are these anonymous sources, which I think should be used sparingly, and only if you're a credible institution. Well, how can you have any credibility if all the polls that you talked about in 2016 all were false, all the predictions are false? I, my message to the, your audience is when they tell you about these anonymous sources, simply say, I don't believe you unless you show me. Unless you name the guy and, name and the have people. the quote. Isn't this true, though? We, we talk, you focus on the, on the press and the media, but wouldn't this also include, say, Hollywood? Now, Hollywood traffics mainly not in documentaries like I make, but in stories. But if you follow the Hollywood stories and you follow, for example, what goes on in television, you find that there are certain stock villains. For example, if there's a bad guy, first of all, he's usually a white guy. He's usually a guy. And he's usually a businessman. Mm -hmm. So the businessman is portrayed as evil. And so by the use of these propagandistic tropes, mm -hmm. the media is able to tell a meta story, a kind of big story behind the story. The, the reason I use the term the big lie, Hitler says somewhere, he goes, a small lie you can catch. If someone were to tell you a small lie, you can compare it with your own experience. You can verify whether it's credible or not. But a big lie often comes not even in the conclusion, but in the assumption, mm -hmm. in the assumption. So, um, so what we're dealing with here is an effort, I think, not only to present a story, but to bring all of society into line with that story. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't want to debate, for example, the gay issue, but I think what is striking today is the degree to which people, for example, who have any moral reservations on this topic are sort of cudgeled, cajoled, browbeaten into submission, mm -hmm. and any public figure who takes the wrong stance has to be driven from public life. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's the more dangerous form of fascism. It's not these Antifa loons on the street, you know. Right, uh, right, I mean, right. they're a danger, and the Nazis did do all that. Right. But, but what they did even more, s in a more sinister way, is the great philosopher Heidegger, who was mm -hmm. at the University of Freiburg. Uh, he would basically work to bully all the faculty to fall into line with the Fuhrer. Mm -hmm. That's what's going on in our colleges right now. So that, to me, is a more characteristic form of fascism, except it's occurring in seemingly in the private sector. I think that's what I think is striking. Well, and I think uh, when the other an example I use is F.I. Hayek on The Road to Serfdom writes that we, we cannot allow, he's talking about this sort of these people that you're referring to, they cannot allow information and he wrote a book about truth or journalism, a, a chapter in his book, I, I wrote a certain, he says, we cannot allow information that leads people to conclusions that we don't like. So they literally do not want you to see certain information. If it leads you to, a, if it leads a free people to a conclusion that we don't want them to be led to. And then when you turn on CNN, what do you see? You don't see investigative reporting. You don't see, like, let me look at this evidence and make my own decision. It's a bunch of people talking sort of just gobbledygook. 
Um, so there's this conflict that's happening. Uh, the way I put it is a conflict of visions between sort of my vision of the world, which is a free people are smart enough to make decisions about what, you know, who to vote for, and the media, which has shoved narratives down your throat, and here you should vote for Hillary Clinton. Now, when, when, when people talk about fake news, and when, when people talk about, I saw a Project Veritas video, fake news, um, are, you trying, are you trying to show that the media, while posing as neutral, reliable, objective, are actually in cahoots with one side mm -hmm. and are manufacturing a narrative to fit that. Would you say, is that an accurate description? Well, what What's we, your goal? What are you trying to do? My goal is to expose the real motivations of the people that deliver us the information. And in the case of CNN, it was the supervising producer, John Bonifield in Atlanta, said into the hidden camera he did not know he was being taped. And honestly, I don't think this guy was necessarily a villain. I mean, he's going along with the culture of CNN, but sometimes there are people inside of CNN who disagree with the culture. And he says, the CEO of CNN said in our internal meetings, you must stop doing your investigative reporting work. Russia, 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 Russia. He's, he's saying this. He doesn't know he's being recorded, uh, testifying to us about that. And, uh, you know, listen, a lot of these guys are not, are not villainous. They're just going along with the... Uh, the villain is, would be the CEO on top who sets the culture. And I didn't see any politics there because he said, it's all for money, it's all for ratings. And not to, I, was, I, qu I quoted Noam Chomsky here yesterday, but Noam Chomsky wrote a book called Manufacturing Consent. Now, Noam Chomsky is a leftist, but there are some things in there that are true about the way the media operates, that there's a proximity to sources, there's a need to, to drive a profit, and CNN, the more they have this left-wing audience, the more they need to deliver to their audience whatever the tropes are, to, to, to give the audience what they want to hear, and that's how they're going to get the ratings. Ironically, now the ratings have gone down so bad. Well, I think the very important point you're making here is that, you know, the ordinary naive American turns on the TV, you open up the newspaper, and you literally think, this is what happened yesterday in America or in the world. And I think what you're showing is, wait a minute, when I show you the sausage-making process at work, you realize, no, somebody decided that this would be news. That's right. Somebody wrote that headline in that way. They could have written a different headline. They could have shown a different picture. The lead paragraph could have been very different. All of this is the product of conscious choice, and that choice is itself the product of motivations, proclivities, and priorities. And characterizations. And I, I use the word characterization. Like when they talk about me, it's, it's name-calling. It's all, it's, I selectively edit. This is probably the greatest, most disingenuous criticism of our work, that we selectively edit. First of all, we show video, for all, all, all journalism is selectively edited, but certainly the written word on the New York Times is far more selectively edited than our five minutes of uncut tape showing the producer saying that Russia's nothing burger. Well, uh, this is what, in the book, I call transference. In other words, the left takes the bad things that they do. And Their own it. bigotry, their own intolerance, and they project it onto their opponent. And so we, the party of tolerance, and the party of civility, and the party of limited government, uh, and the party that would never dr dream of doing to them what they do to us, uh, we get saddled with responsibility for their crimes. For their, for it's their a good crimes. point. It's a good point. James, I want to thank you for coming by. I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, you're doing great work. Please keep it up and help us to keep exposing the big lie. We've got another series of tapes coming out, uh, I'd say around Labor Day, next target being the media, this one being the Holy Grail, and it'll be a bombshell. Oh, can't wait. We can't wait. <laughs> nice to see you. Thanks, Thank Thanks you. so much for coming by. Folks, we're talking about um, uh, my forthcoming new book, um, The Big Lie, it comes out July 31st. And this is my first live book signing. But uh, you can get a copy of the book, uh, autographed, signed. I'm signing them actually right now as we speak. Um, you can also get a sample chapter of the book um, and um, read it today. Uh, and you can ask questions and take part in the discussion that we're having uh, about fascism in the age of Trump. Yes, we're really enjoying reading all your questions, so uh, keep them coming. Um, this next question comes from San Francisco, Christine from San Francisco. I love your movies. So much information and most importantly, the truth. Will you be making a movie out uh, about the big lie? This is Christine from San Francisco. I'm thinking about it and, uh, and I actually I think I will. 
uh, particularly if our politics continues in this kind of overheated, crazy way that I think it's going to continue. In fact, I, I would predict that, if anything, things are going to get worse. The left is so dug in against Trump. They're so dug in against the Republicans that they can't possibly let go. They can't admit we're in a normal politics. Trump, in that sense, is not, not fundamentally different from any other elected president. Their view is that he's, he's Mussolini circa 1922 or Hitler circa 1933, uh, and they're out to get him out of there. So I think that this thing is only going to heat up, which means that Trump needs every ally he can get. Uh, and if my work is going to have the kind of impact that I'm hoping for, I need your help in getting it out there. Right. And that means uh, when I have a book, if you get it, it'll help me. It help funds my research, uh, help get the information to other people, and then the movies. Uh, see them in the theater. Uh, the fate of a movie depends decisively on how it does in the theater. So keep an eye out next summer. We might, uh, we might be doing a film based on The Big Lie and some other stuff that we're working on for yeah. next summer um, in the year of the midterm yeah. election. Yeah, so it'll, it can really help the midterm election, just like I think Hillary's of, America helped with this election. So, a lot of Democrats are yeah, up next yeah. time around, and in fact, this is a chance for us to go from a majority yeah. to we, a supermajority. If we get a supermajority, that's when we can really start right. making some changes. Exactly, exactly. Okay, so we have one from Nancy from Peoria. Um, why is it that seemingly sensible people have such a hatred for Trump and will not give him any credit for the good he's doing? They can't seem to separate Trump the man from Trump the policies. You know, that's a, Trump is an outsider. Mm -hmm. In that sense, he does not represent something that is familiar. Mm -hmm. uh, he talks in a way unfamiliar for politicians. Right. Well, he's um, not a politician. He's not a politician. So. You know, even though Trump's a billionaire, he grew up on the, the, the mean streets of Queens. Mm -hmm. And he grew up with an ethos in which if, you know, you punch him in the nose, he's going to punch you in the nose. Not literally, but on Twitter. Right, right. He's going to let you have it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you know, again, even Republicans will say, oh, get, get to, you know, take away his Twitter, take away his Twitter. If you take away Trump's Twitter, you're disarming him of the one weapon that he has to be able to get through to the American people without the filter of the media. Uh, look, I think we're living in abnormal times. Trump is a product of those abnormal times. Um, and I think that he is the man of the hour. He is what we need now, crazy though he seems at times. Mm -hmm. uh, and for those of us who have been in American politics for 30 years, he is a new face and he does think, he right. doesn't accept the given parameters of right. politics. Here are the two, uh -huh. you know, um, railings and you got to walk in the middle. Trump goes, I'm not doing it. Yeah, primarily, I'm glad he's not doing primarily it. it's it could be because he doesn't know where the perimeters are, right? He doesn't, he doesn't know or care. Or care, right? That's probably the more important thing right. because he is in that sense unbeholden. We're right. very delighted to have here Steve Moore. Uh, Steve Moore has been a, a scholar, an economist, a writer, an author. He was with the Wall Street Journal. He's been an advisor to the Trump campaign and the, maybe the Trump. Uh, White House now. Uh, Steve, I'm delighted you're here. Welcome to uh, our discussion. Hi, Dinesh. You know, I got your book last week in the mail, and I have to confess I haven't read it. And the reason I haven't read it is my wife picked it up and she <laughs> snatched it from me. And she, she Maybe put she it should have been here today. <laughs> so she should be doing what? it. With you no, no, actually. <laughs> like, I said, well, what's the, you know what? Tell me. She, she told me all about what's in, what's in the book. So Steve, I feel I, like I've read it even though I haven't. <laughs> I, I take that as a very good sign. I, I, I want I want the person who picks up the book not to be able to put it down. So ho hopefully you'll get it when she's done. Um, let's talk a little bit about about uh, fascism um, because I want to ask you this question. Um, fascism is is often perceived today, is portrayed by the left mm -hmm. as being a right wing phenomenon. Right, right wing phenomenon. In fact, can I just stop you right there? Yeah, it's interesting if you look. I mean, you're sure, I haven't read the book yet, but if you look. It's how the definition of fascism has changed. So it used to be fascism was, you know, a charismatic leader who wanted, who, who would try to convince people that you could do things that were impossible and so on. And now, in a lot, I, I actually, because I wrote a column on fascism, and the definition has migrated to a right wing person who says da da da. So only a right winger can be a fascist, almost by definition now. That I think was the was something that the progressives um, were able to pull off 
in right. the generation after World War II, they recognized that with the, the horrors of, of the Holocaust, fascism now becomes the dirtiest word in the, in the mm -hmm. English language, in the Western vocabulary. So they realized if we can take this thing and smear the right with it, mm -hmm. we will essentially have discredited those That's people exactly right. in advance. But to do that, I noticed they've had to camouflage fascist ideology. Mm -hmm. For example, Hitler's National Socialism, they had to sort of take the socialism out of National Socialism in order to be able to convince people that this was a right-wing <laughs> phenomenon. Um, well, let me give you an example. Um, so again, if you look at the definition of your Encyclopedia Britannica of fascist, it says stuff like, this is a charismatic leader who tries to persuade people that you can do things that everyone knows you can't do. And well, uh, Barack Obama said that he was going to stop the rise of the oceans. <laughs> that, that is a rather, and he's a charismatic leader who tried to convince people that all of these things that he could do, uh, you know, he would be able to do. And and yet, you would never hear a, 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 someone on the left describe dream of Barack calling Obama call, uh, as a uh, as a fascist. Well, I would make the case, by the way, that uh, if you look at the presidential um, race, because I worked for Trump, and the left always called Trump a fascist, but there was there was a fascist in this race, and his name was Bernie Sanders. And Bernie Sanders wanted a 70% tax rate. He wanted the government takeover of industries, just like Mussolini did. Um, if you if you ask yourself objectively, who was the, who was the fascist in this race? It was it was probably Bernie Sanders. Now liberals would would scream bloody murder at that characterization, but um, he certainly was. Well, he's a lot like Hugo Chavez, that's for sure. So <laughs> exactly. Good. You know, you I, go. I think that this is where this is where the left has been very cunning in taking, I would call them, the incidental features of fascism mm -hmm. and ignoring the central ones. So let's take, for example, if, if, if you had a, uh, an intelligent leftist making the fascist case against Trump, this is something like what he would say. He'd say, first of all, Trump is a nationalist. Right. Trump is a militarist. Trump is an authoritarian. Trump is a xenophobe and a racist. And aren't those right. the distinguishing features? And they'll say he's a demagogue. Yeah, a demagogue. Right. And aren't those the distinguishing features of fascism? Well, my answer is no. Those are actually not the key distinguishing features of fascism. And here's how I can prove my point. Let's take something like nationalism, right? Gandhi was a nationalist. Che Guevara was a nationalist. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Stalin was a nationalist who celebrated mm -hmm. what he called Mother Russia. Every anti-colonial leader, Nkrumah in Ghana, was a nationalist. Castro was a nationalist. So if nationalism equals fascism, you would have to say that Che Guevara, you'd have to say that Gandhi, Mandela, uh, Nkrumah, uh, uh, Stalin were all fascists. Well, some of them actually were, yeah. but, but all of them weren't. So clearly nationalism by itself doesn't mean fascism. Same with authoritarianism. There are all kinds of authoritarian. Well, except that the new left is internationalist. So they yes. actually don't believe in national government anymore. They mm -hmm. want international government. Mm -hmm. they, want, they actually do believe in one world government. Mm -hmm. So their ideology has actually evolved from mm -hmm. nationalism to the United Nations. And that's why they want the climate change, you know, Paris Accord, because mm -hmm. it basically o supersedes even local government, you know, state and, and national control over decisions in people's lives. Mm -hmm. And having these super, that's why, you know, I would make the argument to, to you, Dinesh, that's why the Brits got out of, uh, of uh, the European Union because they didn't want people in Brussels telling them how to live their life in, in London. Let's talk about fascist economics. Isn't it true that, that fascism is state control of industry? That's what Mussolini yes. did. Right. That's what Hitler did. They started their own state-run corporations like the Goring Corporation and so on. But by and large, they, they left the private sector. They just told the private sector what to right. do, right? Now, if we look at what's happened under Obama over eight years, yeah. We haven't seen socialism. I haven't seen a single industry completely nationalized in the classic socialist sense. But what I have seen is a government takeover of the healthcare sector, every hospital, every hospice, every doctor. I've seen a government, the government directing the banks mm -hmm. and the insurance companies. Although that happened under Bush. That happened as well, under Bush, right? but you saw a, a new <laughs> yes, degree of, of it. Uh, then we've seen the government control expanding over the energy sector through That's the EBA. The big one. That's, That's a big, big one. one. And then we were, we, if Hillary and Bernie had prevailed, 
I think we would have seen a government takeover of education. Again, the government does regulate it now, but the degree would have been much greater. Their whole idea of free education was, was essentially a government takeover of the education. I think the sector. classic example would be what they've done with energy. They basically decided they're going to choose. We have multiple ways we can get electric power in this country. Nuclear power, hydropower, natural gas, coal, wind, solar. And they basically said, okay, no, it's going to be wind and solar. In other words, we believe, let the market decide, you know, which is going to be the best form of energy. So what they're doing is they're just showering money so much money with this into the solar and wind industry they're picking the winner and they're they're so it, it, by the way those two industries would truly would not exist today solar and wind power were it not for these massive subsidies and and mandates that consumers buy it so that's a that's sort of the classic example of a corporate welfare model which is which is in a lot of ways fascist yeah that's my point is that isn't it true that obamaism in its in an economic sense is more fascist than it is socialist so in that, here's, well, go ahead. Uh, here's what I think about this. I think all these isms <laughs> are alike in one sense. <laughs> that whether you call it communism, socialism, fascism, Nazism, uh, you know, Stalinism, what did they all have in common? That <laughs> government is going to control your life, yeah. and you know, so. You know, when you say, like, well, what's the difference between communism and socialism? You know, what's the difference between socialism and Nazism? Well, they're, it's, they're, but they're all about centralizing power into the hands of Okay, people. now I think we're onto something very deep here, and that is that collectivism right. is what progressivism, socialism, and fascism have in common. Yes. Now, the reason people don't know this is they think, well, that can't be the case, because after all, didn't Hitler fight against the Russians? So right. aren't fascism exactly. and communism on the opposite? And, and FDR, how can you possibly say that the New Deal was in bed with fascism? Didn't FDR defeat Mussolini? Didn't he defeat Hitler? Now, this is what I call history through the rear view mirror with the benefit of hindsight today we look back when we think for example of fascism and nazism we think of the holocaust but let's remember that the early fascists of the 20s and 30s they didn't know about the holocaust fascism wasn't connected with holocaust then uh, so i think part of what we do in a book uh, in, in 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 a genuine effort to understand something is we try to recover the original meaning yeah. and, and even the appeal of what drew people to fascism? And I think what you're saying is the same thing that drew them to communism. Yeah, so for example, let me give you an example. So Bernie Sanders called himself a socialist. At least, he, you know, at least he's honest about what he is. Then you, if I were to say to a liberal, oh, he's a communist, they say, well, no, he's not. He's a, con he's a socialist. Not a, and then I say, well, what's the difference between a con And they'd say, socialists mean well. <laughs> they have good intentions. Communists don't. Well. You know, the intentions don't matter, it's where it leads you. And, and, and socialism is the economic policy of communism. Exactly. That, that, that communism is more comprehensive. Communism, yeah. for example, entails atheism, and socialism inherently doesn't. You can think of communism as the umbrella ideology and socialism as its economic department, so to speak. I think that's right. Mm -hmm. um, Steve, um, where, are we, where are we headed with all this? I mean, is, it, it appears like there's an effort underway to uproot Trump and Trumpism and everything that means. And there are some Republicans who are on board with that. So. What's relevant to, especially relevant to your book, is the debate that's going on in healthcare right now, as we speak. And again, Bernie Sanders, I kind of admire Bernie Sanders because at least he's honest about where he wants to take the country. I mean, he's, I don't think that Chuck Schumer is different than Bernie Sanders. It's just that Bernie Sanders is honest about where he wants to take the country mm -hmm. and Schumer isn't. Mm -hmm. So we are now at a, a crossroads in this country. Obamacare is a complete, utter failure in every respect. It is melting down right even, before Even its own side is now kind of admitting yeah. that. Now, well, they're saying, well, it only needs bandages, but that's mm -hmm. like saying, well, you know, hitting the iceberg for the Titanic was just a minor accident. I mean, the whole thing, is, within in two or three years, it's going to be in complete collapse. So now we're at a crossroads in this country. We're either going to use the free enterprise system to solve the healthcare crisis, or as Bernie Sanders say, we'll just have a, the government run the system. Now that's a very, very dangerous idea. We're talking about one sixth of our economy. I would argue one of the two or three most important industries in America that protects our health and, and our well being. And we may make them, and I'm not convinced we're going to win at this point. You know, the left wants us to have a single payer and I run into more and more liberals to say that's the only way to go. The government is going to run a health care system. And by the way, as you know, Dinesh, we have a government run healthcare system in America today. It's called the Veterans Administration System and people die in the hospitals. 
Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about what, um, you know, what the appeal of fascism was. Right. And part of what I want to, I think in order to fight a set of ideas, you have to understand their appeal. Steve, I want to thank you for coming by. Thank I really you. appreciate the time. You've made some very valuable on the comments. New book. Can't thank wait you. to read it when my wife loves me. <laughs> uh, I think you may have That's to great. cry it out of her hands. <laughs> so, but no, I'm delighted she's reading it. That's thank wonderful. You. Thank, thank you. you so much, Steve. We're talking thank about, um, we're talking about my forthcoming new book, um, The Big Lie. Uh, I like the subtitle. It, it reflects my inherent taste for moderation, <laughs> exposing the Nazi roots of the American left. Now, by the way, um, some people might say, well, you know, it's one thing to say the left is fascist. What, what's this nonsense about the left being Nazi? Well, the truth of it is that if you look at the history of the Democratic Party, it far more resembles Nazism than it resembles fascism. The fascists were not inherently racist. Uh, Mussolini, for example, did a lot to actually rescue Jews uh, in the Nazi era. Uh, but National Socialism, the Hitler brand of fascism, was inherently racist. In that sense, it mir mirrors the 150-year history of racism in the Democratic Party. So the book is explosive. It couldn't be more timely. Uh, by the way, the website, the Big Lie, I'm sorry, uh, BigLieBook.com slash live. That's where you can sign up to get an autographed copy to read a sample chapter. And I think, honey, if we have time, let's take a couple more a questions couple more before, questions. We, yeah, before yeah, we, we wrap um, it up. We actually do. We have uh, one from Rob from uh, Alpharetta. Where is Alpharetta? Georgia. Georgia. All right. OK, so uh, why are the Democrats who blatantly break the law never are never prosecuted by Republicans in power? Conservatives hold all three branches of government. Are they asleep at the wheel? They're, they're not asleep. They're, they're terrified of the power of the opposition. Now, the power of the opposition is not the Democratic Party. If this were a fight between the Republicans and the Democrats, quite frankly, we would squash them like a bug. The Democrats have, they have academia, they have the media, and they have Hollywood. And those are the three biggest megaphones of our culture. In some sense, you can almost see the media impatient with the incompetence of the Democrats, shoving the Democrats aside and saying, step aside, you mm -hmm. fools. We will take on Trump because we know how to destroy him. Mm -hmm. and, and for the media, I think since Watergate, they genuinely feel they have a veto power over the democratic system. Yes, electorate, you choose the president. We'll get to decide if he's acceptable or not. Now, the Republicans are scared of this cultural power because it's one-sided. We mm -hmm. have nothing to go up against it. You can't say Fox News because a lot of people don't even have cable. Uh, the combined power of ABC, CBS, NBC, NPR, PBS dwarfs Fox that's, News that's over 80 by million. 50 to yeah, 1. Yeah. Uh, similarly, the, the incredible power of Hollywood. Hollywood is an incestuous insider operation, and they own it. Mm -hmm. I mean, my little films, for example, I mean, the big guy in Hollywood is not Michael Moore. Again, I can run against Michael Moore. I can do much better than Michael Moore. I am doing much better than Michael Moore. Uh, but um, I'm not doing much better than Steven Spielberg. And he's the gold standard of Hollywood feature films. Ultimately, to fight them, uh, we have to realize that the battlefield isn't just politics. It's also culture. Mm -hmm. Can't wait to do that. I think it's going to be great. Uh, do we have time for one more? Yeah, one more question. Here we go. And and guys, um, let's see. Hold on a second here. Okay, this this question is from Eileen in Gleason, uh, Eileen Gleason from Phoenix, Arizona. How do we battle the ignorance of the youth regarding socialism and fascism? Well, quite honestly, the, the answer is right here. Because in one book, uh, you will get not just a superficial, but kind of a deep understanding of how fascism came about. For example, a little tidbit. Fascism grew directly out of Marxism. Uh, early in the 20th century, there was the crisis of Marxism. Uh, Marx had made a series of predictions that the m communist revolution would erupt in Germany or in England, that the working class would become increasingly proletarianized or increasingly poor. That didn't happen. The working class was getting richer. And so there was a crisis of Marxism, and out of that came two hybrids, two offshoots of Marxism. The first, Leninist Bolshevism, and the other, Mussolini and Hitler style fascism and national socialism. Those were the two, you may say, bastard children 
of the crisis of Marxism. No, it's true. It's true. And, um, and so fascism's origins are 100% on the left. The big lie, Hitler's term, is the clever leftist effort to move fascism from the left-wing column, where it's always belonged, into the right-wing column. That is a fraud. That's something, if we are not equipped, we will become victimized by the fraud. We will become like these weak-kneed Republicans who don't know what to say when the left has them up against the wall. Don't be one of those people. Go to bigliebook.com slash live. Order your copy of The Big Lie. Help me get the word out through your friends and your social media. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us. Yes. Honey, thank you for sharing um, the podium with they, me on this. Well, you know what? I think we need to have our own show. I like this. You, I, you're, you're, I like I, this a I, lot. I see that you're you a like little it? bit warming up to I'm the format. Little, I'm a little comfortable. And you're a bit of yeah. a ham, okay, so that so, okay. it's, it suits you. Yeah, too bad I couldn't belt out a few tunes, though. You know, sorry. So I just, I just want to thank everybody for tuning in and sending your questions and buying, buying the book. Uh, remember, you are first to get this book, so this is really, really a, a cool thing that we did done today. So, honey, if, if you, you sign up, yeah. uh, books will be shipped to you soon. So please sign up. Uh, we will sign. I've, I've signed books. I'll be signing more of them, so you can get a signed copy. And the free advanced chapter of this book will be emailed to buyers of the book tonight. So get it, and the chapter will be sent to you by email. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.